Hello, hello, and welcome back to Modern Monarchy, a podcast on a British royal family, a British royal family, the British royal family, from an American interested in how it all works, how it's evolving, and how it's managed to last as long as it has. I really got a fire lit under my behind when (laughs) Megan actually started dishing out podcast episodes and I was like she she can't have more episodes than me I I don't know why I feel that way because she is getting paid somewhere around 18 to 25 million dollars more than I am and she has like 28 employees more than I have to do this but here we are you know we're gonna do this we're gonna spitball this. I spent actually the last couple of months trying to improve my workflow because I got way out of hand <laughs> and I went ham. I went full tilt into this. I started all of the accounts at the same time um and I had a vision in my head for how I wanted this podcast to sound and I know how to do things in editing but it's like I needed to start creating habits to get used to podcasting on a regular basis because I don't have the help so this is quite a bit of work if you want to edit on the level that I was trying to edit Um, so I think for the beginning, while I'm just getting the, um, the habits down of doing this, we're just going to kind of spit ball here. I was working on a script and after about the sixth time of sitting down with said script, I just kept going back to the top of the script and reading it through so I could get back into the rhythm of what I was writing. And as I was doing that, I kept editing what I'd already written because I was like, well, that doesn't sound like how I talk. Because I wanted the script to make editing, oh my gosh, to make editing easier. (laughs) But Uh, I didn't want it to sound like I was reading a script. I just know as a podcast listener, I kind of tune out when somebody's voice has a rhythm. I just not, I'm not here anymore. Um, so I was trying to avoid that by typing how I speak, but I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't making any progress. So we've gone back to me having a outline and we're just gonna go from there and I'm hoping that I won't have too many like blank spaces and ums to edit out I know I I just really I sound like I'm complaining and you know I'm not gonna edit it out (laughs) I will apologize if it's annoying to you (laughs) um So, other than on Spotify and Anchor, uh, I have a Twitter, which is where you can find me, like, all of the time. It is at underscore Modern Monarchy. There's an Instagram, which is at Modern Monarchy Podcast. I also upload these episodes um, onto YouTube. I don't have video I might do it later down the line, but as you can see, just talking and editing that, listening to my own voice while I edit, oh, I hate the sound of my voice. I don't hate the sound of my voice in person. Recorded, listening back, mmm, that's different. It hits different. Anyways, the ep- uh, episodes go up on there with basically the podcast logo, so... It's not something you really want to watch, but something you could put on in the background while you're doing dishes, meal prepping, food, because that's mostly when I listen to podcasts is while I'm at work and while I'm meal prepping for work um, or when you're going for walks or whatever. 
Oh, yeah. And also, if you are driving right now or you don't have time to write this down or find me on these accounts, if you go to this podcast, hopefully at any account, you should find a link tree that will attach you to, that will link you to anything, uh, any of the other accounts. Alrighty. Without further ado. Do let's get into this podcast. I know you're new here, and I know you're new here, unless you're listening to this three years from now, because I'm also new here. <laughs> so when I listen to a new podcast, and this goes for mainly British royal news, well, I listen to I dabble in other royals, but that's because. Some other podcasts also talk about other European royals, and I'm not as interested. I'm not. There's just so much meat on this bone. I, I'm not hungry, okay? And so what I do when I listen to a new podcast is I listen to the latest episode. And that is the one where I feel like you, unless you're having a bad day, you have your shit most together. You know what you're doing. Uh, I can figure out the structure of your show. Listen to your voice. Because some people... I'm not naming names. But there's there's some podcasts that I listen to frequently. But I have to just kind of like skip around looking for the important stuff. And then the next two episodes that I look for are... Based on, like, the title of the episodes, I can hopefully figure out which episodes kind of are going to give me how you feel about the monarchy and maybe how you feel about the whole Sussex issue. And it's not that I want to listen only to people with my opinion. It's whether or not I agree with you. I need to know how you're filtering all the the news that you're you're tossing out there. Um, but today, this is gonna be your most recent episode, and I'm gonna give you the down low on how I feel about the monarchy. So let's talk about people who want the monarchy abolished, which, by the way, I don't. I don't particularly love that they exist, right? Like, I get enjoyment from watching them from afar. I get entertainment from watching the drama sometimes. I also really root for them when good things happen. And when you spend enough time essentially stalking them from afar, they are like distant family members. And I definitely feel like that's on purpose. And because... All of their major life moments have to be available to the public, which is why you get so excited when there's a wedding or why they post pictures when someone has a baby or those kids start going to school. And and then when, like, somebody dies, it actually makes you sad because not only is it, like, a celebrity, but it's a whole family. And they kind of feel like they're your extended family that doesn't bother you. (laughs) Although, it would be nice if they would invite me over for Christmas. I would appreciate that. I'd like an invite to Sandringham. Actually, hmm, let me think about that. By the way, if you can hear noise in the background, my cat is walking around and he's probably going to want to try to knock things over, aren't you? Yeah, so I was thinking about it and I thought that maybe I'd want to go to Balmoral more because I like Scotland, but really, if we're going to be family, I would like full access. 
Mm hmm. I mean, I'll call before I show up. Don't worry. I mean, text. Nobody wants a call. Anyways, I'm getting. I'm getting off track here. So, back to people who actually do want the monarchy abolished. The first thing they always say is they cost too much money. And I just. I don't think that's a good enough excuse. Firstly, all governments cost too much money. There's a lot of things that your money is going towards that you don't freaking know about. <laughs> and not to mention, if you did abolish the monarchy, you must have a lot more trust in your government than I do mine to think that you're not going to have to pay that still because they're still going to take that money. You're just not going to have a royal family. They're going to need to pay for maintenance and staffing for all of the residences and palaces that no longer have people living in them but they've now become tourist traps. <laughs> and I feel like that's not as exciting as actually having like a living, breathing royal family. Another excuse I hear a lot is that they don't do anything, which, I mean, there might be a few that don't do anything, but... I really feel like Charles is actually going to slim down the monarchy. He seems like even if you go on his Instagram page, they have on uh, Clarence House, and they have three pinned images at the top of the page. And one of them is a picture of the balcony from the Jubilee where it's literally just Queen Elizabeth, Charles and Camilla. And the Cambridges. And it's pinned at the top. I was like, this is the royal family. And when I think about it, the, the thought of most days, for me, for me, I'm not queen, right? I pretend I'm just Catherine. I'm just a princess. But I still got to get dressed to the freaking nines every day day and go out and talk to people I don't know. Do you have any idea how much energy and brain power and social battery that takes? Holy crap, I do not wish that on anybody. <laughs> but you know, if they're going to get paid a bunch of money and have a guaranteed place to live, cool. I also think that when they do go to social engagements, they see a lot of people who have been through terrible things, who have also worked their asses off their entire lives, and just meeting you, meeting, meeting me, the Duchess of Cambridge, is going to make their life, maybe. It's gonna at least make their day. You have to be fully there and fully involved in having conversation with these people who are probably have, have no idea what to say to you. <laughs> and you have to craft your words so that somehow, hopefully, you don't end up in the paper offending a bunch of people. <laughs> and that's your entire life. And actually, as you get older, if you're in line for the throne, you get more responsibilities. There isn't really a work-life balance. They don't even get to retire. Not that I'm saying I'll be able to retire, but <laughs> at least I won't have to get dressed up as the queen at 96 years old to be going to engagements and trying to have conversations with people who are probably 
less than half my age. I can't even imagine. As much as I don't agree with people who want the monarchy abolished, I also just like, if, if they did get abolished, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be that upset. <laughs> I would just be like, oh, well that sucks. <laughs> I just feel like those people think it's, it's just not fair that a very small few of people on this planet are just born into royalty. They're just born into all of this privilege and wealth. So if we're going to keep the monarchy, which I, I think, I think we're on course for, <laughs> um, they don't have any political power. So if they don't have any power, the best thing that they're good for is using their status to call attention to those in need. They have the kind of pull that heads of state don't have because heads of state usually have a party, which means they usually have a group of people that back them and a group of people that don't. And they usually have an agenda that follows their party's rule. And celebrities aren't really trained to deal with people on a humane level. They're just, you know, trained in whatever they're good at, whether it's a sport or acting or singing. And then they get some press training, hopefully, <laughs> if, if, if you have a good manager. And, but other than that, like, people don't really take you that seriously. They don't usually think celebrities are that intelligent. And also, we don't have celebrities meeting with other heads of state, which is another reason that you need to pay to have a royal family and the royal palaces and whatnot, because that's where all these heads of state go. But ultimately, it just comes down to the royal family's popularity, right? So we've got William and Catherine, who for the most part are on good standing because they're trying to be more modern about being a family. Prince William is still two steps away from the crown. He he knows that he has more responsibilities now than he did in his 20s and his 30s now that he's 40. <laughs> That's still really weird to me that he's already 40, but he doesn't have that many responsibilities, so he's like, you guys can call me William. We're William and Catherine. You can call me Prince William if you want to. It's not really necessary, and I do think that we're going to start to see William and Catherine really take the um, patronages and the groups of people that they really want to work for and start putting in more effort. Like I know how William celebrated his 40th birthday talking about homelessness and I know everybody wanted some big regal thing like some sort of photo shoot because it was his 40th birthday and he's going to be the king. But you know they also had that portrait with him and Catherine in Cambridge that was done this year and I feel like I, I, I feel like that would cover that more regal celebration of a 40th birthday especially since they're both turning 40 in the same year. Going back to popularity I feel like there's a lot of pressure on William because his father's generation is a hot mess. Apart from Anne, who is a badass motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she got divorced, but like, nobody really made a fuss about that. <laughs> and if I, I feel like if the family was like a bunch of Prince Andrews, 
the monarchy would be over. If it wasn't for the fact that this family is ever so slowly realizing that they need to evolve with the times then it, it probably would have ended around the millennium or maybe sooner. So I think we have to talk about Charles because his only saving grace is William at this point. If it was just Prince Charles and then William was not really into this, Again, I, I feel like it would be over for them. Charles, you better be giving William, like, the best Christmas presents every year because he's the only reason I feel that you are still in the position you're in and the fact that people are mildly accepting of the fact that you guys kind of lied about the whole Camilla being a princess consort instead of queen consort. Which, by the way, I feel like that would be another way to modernize the monarchy. If you're gonna have the men be prince consort because it threatens the queen's power to have a king there, then you should probably make the women be a be princesses, princess consorts. I think that's how that works in the plural. Never really had to talk about them in the plural. <laughs> Usually only have one. So then I wanted to address the topic of Camilla and what happened with Diana. Because a lot of people who do think that Camilla needs to be queen consort also think that these Diana maniacs just need to get over it. It's been 25 years since she died, and it's been even longer since she separated from Prince Charles. And I would, I would like to say that maybe it's just me. Maybe I hold grudges longer than other people. Maybe some people just forget. Because Charles and Camilla have had an uh, aggressive, uh, they've aggressively been working on the PR for the last few decades, the last couple of decades. Definitely in the last few years, I feel like we've seen both of them in the press a lot more. They always seem to be put in a positive or a relatable light. And the way that they're portrayed I feel like if I met Charles and Camilla at a party and I didn't know about their past and I didn't really know who they were, I probably would like them, you know, if I didn't realize how crappy they can be. <laughs> I'm just going to revisit um, Diana in her own words real quick. Just going to read a couple of quotes. You know, this is from Diana's point of view. Doesn't mean everything was exactly the way she said it was, but I am inclined to believe most of it. From what I can tell, she respected the institution enough that she had to be pushed to extremes to get to the point where she was going to start sp spilling the tea, if you will. So let's talk about some things that she said, some things that I highlighted. She says, I got terribly, terribly thin. People started commenting, your bones are showing. So that was the October. And then we stayed up there at Balmoral from August to October. By October, I was in a very bad way. I was so depressed. I was trying to cut my wrists with razors and blades. It rained and rained and rained, and I came down early from Balmoral to seek treatment. Not because I hated Balmoral, but because I was in such a bad way. Anyway, I came down here to London. All the analysts and psychiatrists you could ever dream of came plodding in, trying to sort me out, put me on high doses of Valium, and everything else. 
Later on, she writes, I threw myself down the stairs at Sandringham. Charles said I was crying wolf, and I said I felt so desperate, and I was crying my eyes out. And he said, I'm not going to listen. You're always doing this to me. Sorry. To me. Anyways, <laughs> I'm going writing now. So I threw myself down the stairs. The queen comes out absolutely horrified, shaking. She was so frightened. I knew I wasn't going to lose the baby. <laughs> William. Quite bruised around the stomach. Charles went out riding, and when he came back, you know, it was just dismal. Total dismal. He just carried on out of the door. Once we were in the swimming pool at Highgrove, and I was telling him, William, off, and he turned around to me and said, You're the most selfish woman I've ever met. All you do is think of yourself. And I was so stunned. I mean, this is seven years ago. I said, where did you hear that? Oh, I've often heard Papa saying it. The one thing I've always prided myself on, if I may be so bold, is that I've never been a selfish person. But Charles was always telling me I was being selfish, and I sort of believed it. Here's another quote. And the night before, I wanted to talk to Charles about something. He wouldn't listen to me. He said I was crying whoop. Again, I put that part in. So I picked up his pen knife off his dressing table and I scratched myself heavily down my chest and both thighs. There was a lot of blood and he hadn't made any reaction whatsoever. I was running around the lemon knife, one with the serrated edges. I was just so desperate. I knew what was wrong with me, but nobody else around me understood me. I needed rest and to be looked after inside my house and for people to understand the torment and anguish going on in my head. It was a desperate cry for help. I'm not spoiled. I just need to be allowed to adapt to my new position. I knew the bulimia started the week after we got engaged. My husband put his hand on my waistline and said, Oh, a bit chubby here, aren't we? The first time I was measured for my wedding dress, I was 29 inches around the waist. The day I got married, I was 23 and a half inches. Now, I know it sounds like I made a lot of quotes and maybe you feel like I wasted a lot of time with that, but that was just a handful of quotes. This was this woman's life and repeatedly over and over again, she was crying for help just to have Charles tell her <laughs> that she's crying wolf, she's dramatic, and she's selfish. And then when she goes to see psychiatrists, they put her on Valium. But, you know, anytime anybody says anything about Charles, he plays the victim. You know, or even Camilla. Just read one more quote. Prince Charles wasn't all that supportive. Whenever he rang me up before they got married, he said, Poor Camilla Parker Bowles. I've had her on the telephone tonight because she says there's lots of press out at Boylehide. She's having a very rough time. I never complained about the press to him because I didn't think it was my position to do so. I asked him, How many press are there? He said, Pfft. At least four. I thought, my God, there's 34 here. And I never told him. It doesn't matter that you never told him, because eventually he would see it in action, and he would get jealous of the fact that you're being hounded. <laughs> so anything that happens to him and Camilla, they're just victims of the press. But anything that happens to Diana... She's just crying wolf, and she just is crying for attention. And you'll see this a lot whenever you see, like, an interview with Prince Charles where anybody is critiquing anything about him, even the slight, like, the smallest little bit. When he first started talking about organic gardening and talking to his plants, which actually, like, became a thing in... 
I don't know if it was in the 90s. I remember it in the 90s. I don't know if that's when it started. But people were kind of making fun of him because he said he talked to plants. I mean, it's kind of silly. And if you're trying to find something to make fun of him for, that's not the worst thing in the world. But every time he had, like, an interview around that time, he would just mention to the reporter, like, oh, I would do this, but you lot would say this about me. And it's just, it's just like, shut the fuck up, dude. Just shut up. And this victimhood even went so far as to be brought up with the decline of his marriage. Any of the few times that he would answer a question about the divorce, the separation or anything, it was always like it happened to him. Like it just happened to fall apart. When he was asked if he tried to make it work, his quote was, I tried until the relationship was irretrievably broken. And it's like, you did not try, dude. <laughs> you may have put minimal effort into making sure that Diana got, what, like a psychologist? But you just added to her pain the whole time she was there. You brought her into this family. I know you had pressure to find a virgin. And so that made you marry a girl who was much younger than you and didn't really have all that much in common with you but you still made that choice and I feel like people would feel better about Charles becoming king if he would take responsibility for something because I don't remember if I've ever heard him take responsibility and as the leader of a country that's like the minimum you could ask <laughs> You're going to be the leader of a country with no political power. So all you have is your popularity and your integrity. Sooner than later, you should do another interview and you should let people ask you the hard questions. And you should give some good answers that don't make you the victim. I don't know why I'm talking to Charles. <laughs> He's not going to listen to this. But it just really grinds my gears that even though the social norms for your family is to be cold and distant, never complain, never explain, and we have all these rules that you have to follow, I don't understand how you can treat somebody the way you treated her and not take any responsibility. So that's how I feel about the monarchy <laughs> um i hope you enjoyed this podcast i felt i feel good that i actually got to let it all out now um so from now on whenever you're listening to my podcast just know that i'm coming from a place where i enjoy the monarchy but i don't stand the monarchy Anywho, I think I should go now. Again, the Twitter is at underscore modern monarchy and the Instagram is at modern monarchy podcast. So, or if you're on YouTube, hey, hey, leave me a comment. <laughs> Maybe eventually I'll put my face on here. <laughs> but until then and until the next time, I'm going to go and write up some notes about my best friends the sussexes have a good day bye <laughs>